All right, this is OpenStax US History, Chapter 19, The Growing Pains of Urbanization, 1870 to 1900. We'll be looking at Section 1, Urbanization and Its Challenges. So this term, urbanization, is getting used a lot here, right? We have urbanization here, urbanization here, urbanization there. Essentially what urbanization means is kind of like the growing of cities. And a large part of that has to do with the rise of factories, which allows for centers of production to be located in one area. So as these bigger and more efficient factories were being constructed, more and more people had to move to one particular place in order to go and work there. And as a result, you had cities grow dramatically during this period, 1870 to 1900. You can just see from this uh, info uh, graphic here, uh, in the year 1860, for example, or here, let's use actually a different color. In the year 1860, there was nearly five times as many people living in the rural. Rural is kind of like farm, farms, uh, uh, urban as cities. Uh, nearly five times as many people living in the rural parts of the country than in the urban, whereas by the time you get to the 1920s, there's actually more people in the city than living in, in the farms. And that was for the very first time in American history. Uh, cities like New York, for example, went from 1 million to 3.4 million. Chicago's population increased by 10 times, over 10 times, almost 16 times during this particular area. So we're talking about the growth of cities happening very, very, very rapidly. And because it's happening so quickly uh, and on such a massive scale, there presents many, many, many different challenges uh, in these urban areas. Uh, so some of the keys to successful urbanization meant improvements like electric lighting, uh, both in the factories and in street lights. In factories, it meant that factories could operate 24 seven. Street lights created a little bit more of a, a safer urban area, you might say. Also one that had a lot more uh, like entertainment to draw people into the cities. You know, the streetlights were really big in getting people to move from the farm. Oops. Farm to the city. The allure of the big city was definitely something very, very powerful. Uh, communication improvements also made it a little bit easier. Uh, just looking specifically, you know, here we're talking about things like the telephone. And uh, this increased orders, right? So the, the relationship between communication and production. So more could be bought and sold. So business generally increased, right? So we'll say business generally, you know, increased as communication and, you know, factories could produce 24 seven. Uh, so those, some of the things, electric lighting, communication, uh, transportation, these were all some of the ways in which urbanization could be done the right way. Now, transportation was a little bit of a mess, right? Initially, the primary way to get around in many of these cities was omnibus. This was a horse drawn carriage, right? That was the primary way on, you know, on a set of tracks. This is a essentially what would be an omnibus here. I guess that might not be one, but if there was a horse attached to it, that's what it would be. Uh, but then cities started to get creative with some of the newer technologies and you know how to get a lot of people around. In some areas, they use electric trolley that use the, of course, electric power instead of horses, which meant that they could also operate 24 seven. You didn't have to feed the horse or worry about the horse getting sick or dying. It could also carry more people. Uh, you had cable cars in places like San Francisco which would use uh, you know, a generator to power a cable and then a car would hook onto it and you can go up the big hills, for example, in San Francisco using cable cars. Uh, elevated trains, these were used in some places in the Midwest like Chicago, also in New York, right? Because so many people were congregated in one small area, it was very difficult to build something like a train in the existing infrastructure. And so some cities just simply built trains above uh, all the congestion and all the mess. But maybe one of the more successful was subways, again, going underground. A subway is an underground train. 
and these were more uh, most popular in Boston and New York. So a lot of different creative ways, right? And so there's a varying response and you see these various forms of transportation in, in all cities, but they're essentially trying to do all the same thing. And that is, you know, with this huge growth in the urban population, how do you move people around? And these were all different ways of doing this. This is of course in the pre car or automobile era. Of course, that invention comes a little bit later down the line and ultimately even though a lot of these things exist today in the form of public transportation, for the most part, the automobile is the primary way that we get around. But for a short time between the horse and, and the car, there were a lot of these various ways of having um, uh, transportation to get around. Uh, one thing that also helped urbanization um, take place was the rise of skyscrapers. Skyscrapers are very tall buildings and were really only made possible by the new methods of steel production, where steel was much stronger than it was previously. And so now with all of these people congregated in one area, one way to alleviate that is simply by building up. Uh, the home insurance building in Chicago was the first skyscraper. It was 10 stories and that, you know, but that way by stacking people on top of one another, you could alleviate some of the problems with this very overcrowding, uh, overcrowdedness of cities at the time. Uh, elevators, this invention made skyscrapers more practical, right? When it makes sense to have a, 20 story building, if you had to walk up all those stairs, that'd be very difficult. So with the invention of elevators, which again, utilized new steel, elevators also utilized the new invention of electricity can make these things a lot easier. So cities built out, they create, they, they were bigger, they sprawled outwards, thanks to some transportation networks like trolleys and, and subways, but cities also built up, right? And that was very important in allowing something like, you know, how, how do you fit 16 times as many people into one city uh, over the course of 40 years? Well, skyscrapers helped alleviate that in a lot of areas. Now, the challenges to urban life were many. As you might imagine, a lot of people descending onto one particular area very quickly created a lot of problems, including congestion, pollution from the factories, high rates of crime, and high rates of disease, uh, typhoid and cholera outbreaks, could be incredibly deadly in a lot of these cities. Although there was some, although things like flush toilets and indoor plumbing was making its way to the cities, in a lot of these early cities, it wasn't available. In fact, some of the very first measures that cities took was to um, create sewage systems. So this was some of the first measures cities took to battle disease. Uh, you know, a lot of times these disease outbreaks occurred around sources of water and germs weren't completely understood yet at the time, but uh, you know, especially not by the population or people who lived in those areas. And so by cleaning up the sewage system, that was probably one of the most effective ways to alleviate the suffering, especially the spread of disease like typhoid and cholera in a lot of these cities. Uh, you had various reformers like Jacob Rees. He was a reformer wanting to expose the dangers of urban America. And because of a recent invention, the flash photograph, Oops. Jacob Reese was able to go down to the darkest and most dangerous parts of New York City, and he took pictures. He published those in what he called How the Other Half uh, Lives, and that really exposed a lot of the dangers of urban America at the time. And the idea was, of course, to create reform in response to that. 
Uh, and that was one way that reformers sought to alleviate some of the challenges of urban life. You also had religious groups who preached the social gospel. That is essentially a religious movement, essentially to do the same thing, right? To a religious movement to, uh, let's say, improve urban conditions. So, you know, help or love thy neighbor was a very popular um, saying with this movement to use Christianity to help alleviate the suffering. Le uh, worry less about the afterlife, worry more about this life and, and loving your neighbor. Another way in which reformers sought to improve the urban conditions was through settlement houses. These were, um, you know, here's a settlement house here. It essentially is a structure to help the urban poor, right? a structure to help the urban poor. So a settlement house could serve as a temporary place to stay. It could serve as a school. It can serve as an orphanage. It could serve as a like a hospital. Um, essentially, these were just built inside the cities and would offer a number of various different services to the people living within those cities, especially immigrants. The most famous one was Jane Addams and Hull House. This was a settlement house. in Chicago, All right, settlement house in Chicago. And Jane Addams was someone who was never married, but dedicated her entire life essentially to helping out the urban poor. Another one of these reformers is Florence Kelly. She was much more concerned with child labor, but also child homelessness, which was also uh, a big problem in the city. She helped to establish the National Child Labor Committee and was successful in getting appointed to the Children's Bureau, which of course helped with some of the other uh, issues that affected children specifically in these urban areas.